All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Age, for the kind introduction and uh, Rain Aha's lecture. Exciting. What an honor. Um, the title is here something on conceptual perspective for mobility research, navigation, and wayfinding. Um, what you can see here is a picture generated by an artificial intelligence exactly from this title of this uh, keynote speech or this lecture. Um, it's beautiful. I will come back to that in a, in a, later on. It's uh, DAL-E generated and it, I couldn't have done it myself. Now, Reina has lecture. This is uh, interesting. Um, I was also puzzled a bit myself. What is it now, a lecture? Is it a keynote? Uh, I've decided to do that something in between. So it has some lecture parts. I will introduce something on navigation wayfinding. Um, but it also has a bit of a, I'm, I'm getting out of my comfort zone a bit with some keynote ideas future towards artificial intelligence and something about the concept of trust that we have. Why do we need this? Location-based services, mobility research, and where do we come from? These are some questions as well here. So let's lecture. Location-based services, that is uh, an umbrella term, but it has been around for a while and I was thinking back when does it start or when did it start? And there's a very nice quote from UC Koski from Nokia Research at some point from 2008. It's very likely that personal navigation systems increases and local search mapping services will move from computers to mobile phones. And this is exactly what happened. This was in launch of iPhone, if you recall, it was in 2007 in Germany. And after now many years, I think very few of us are, are having search functions or mapping services on their computer. We all use our mobile phones. Now, this LBS research, just a short uh, slide here on the overview of this, it is an umbrella term. And there is many publications on the progress of, loca of location-based services. Hao, Sheng, Huang and I and others, we have uh, published also a research agenda. Um, this picture is from this research agenda and there is a number of uh, issues we, we tackle with this. One is the data acquisition processes and analysis. Then there has been always uh, in the traditionally something on positioning, indoor positioning, outdoor positioning. And I've put that in fat here, this signal processing, because I believe that artificial intelligence technology will help the signal processing. So eventually our positioning problems will be not so crucial. I will come back to this navigation and wayfinding parts on the mobile phone, but there is many other parts. You can see it, interaction, user studies, and of course, then the last one here, applications, and there is more. If you look at this picture, there are many uh, ideas here, what is part of these location-based services, and one of these is navigation, navigation and wayfinding. Now, if we look at this lo combination or the, the connection between location-based services and uh, mobility research, uh, we need to check a bit uh, where do we come from. And I mentioned it already, there was an posi a social positioning uh, method conference in Tartu in 2008 uh, and I was digging deep into my files and I did find this program from this conference. So this is part of it and uh, if, if you look, it's maybe a bit small, but if you look at these titles and you, you check there, there were also two keynotes at this time, so one from uh, Carlo Ratti from MIT which was LBS and Urban Studies. And Jonathan Raper from the UK, also LBS and research perspectives. So if we take these two concepts, location-based services, mobile positioning, and also mobility research, they are sort of closely related. I've also put here a side note, if you look at the, the last point here, um, this routing um, and mobility research as such as it was done in, in Tartu at that time, in 2008, it was really ahead of its time. 
Agen mentioned it already, but the idea to use mobile phones and to make density maps of population or cellular sensors, uh, it was revolutionary. And it sort of got me hooked as well. I was at this 2008 conference and uh, I, I thought there is really something in this. There's also this picture, uh, I think many of you have seen it, it's from this uh, mobility group where it's the population distribution over Estonia, uh, a very fantastic uh, publication at that time. Now, LBS uh, and mobility research, there's some other um, ideas in this. Um, I have to quote Rein Ahas, and there is one quote from him, very famous one, how to deal with moving dots. I like this very much, this how to deal with moving dots, because it, it summarizes a very complex problem into a very simple question. Um, originating from this how to deal with moving dots, we can have many, many other research ideas, so complex population density models in, in multidimensional space, or uh, also the second point, this mobile phone as sensor data, uh, people as sensors, uh, that has been researched after this a very long time. There's many up, uh, publications on this, many ideas originating from these ideas. And you can see this picture as well. It's still unsolved. How do we, how do we communicate, how do we explore this, this information? Now, I also digged in my own stuff into Mobile Tarto, and one thing I noticed is this uh, routing and wayfinding. Um, it is very interesting, and um, I, I named it at that point personalized uh, routing and wayfinding. It was around 2012, but still ongoing there. This was the first ideas here. Um, and let's take a look what has happened. I've chosen this as a sort of a, a lecture example a bit for this uh, Rein Ahas lecture, uh, and see what we can do with this personalized routing. If we know these uh, routing services, so you can see here in these pictures, there's a number of in-car routing devices, so starting from the very early ones, and then uh, we know, remember the TomTom, -tom, the older ones at least, and then there's in-car navigation systems from uh, BMW, they are getting more and more sophisticated. This routing and wifi finding, it has been always a sort of prominent area within the, in the umbrella topic of location-based services. And um, at that point, when we look at these in-car routing systems here, the underlying technology, um, I, I would say it was still primitive. Yeah? We have the shortest path or we have the fastest path. I put there uh, today, this morning, still this R question mark in there, um, because the underlying technology is still going towards that direction. We had uh, very interesting talks yesterday also, and in a way, all of our routing ideas, we are still optimizing time or distances. Yeah? We want to be there, we want to be fast, or it should be a short route. Now, there is a lot of uh, research on this and, and also extended research, uh, the greenest path, the safest path, um, um, also connected to bike data. Uh, in Helsinki, there's very active research on that. Um, but let's focus a bit on the car stuff. The last point is, is it possible to find routes that sort of coincide with personalized routing preferences? Personalized meaning either from a group of people or maybe even an individual preferences. Maybe all of us in this room, we have individual preferences, how we want to be routed. Let's take a look into something more clear here. There's an idea. At that time, uh, we have looked into, we called it uh, driver's beginner's routing, Fahranfänger routing. Um, we have changed this a bit into inexperienced driver's routing, because the, apparently there is a lot of people who do have a driver's license already for a long time, but still feel very uncomfortable to drive, uh, maybe let's through Tallinn or to certain, certain uh, situations. Now, if we take this inexperienced driver's routing, the first thing is maybe they want an easy to drive route. And now is the question, what is an easy to drive route? We have really 
this is complicated. We, we maybe we have an idea, but what would need, what we would need is a, a user-centered uh, study or user-centered perspective, not a, this this kind of a very uh, often taken technological solution, an engineering perspective. Yeah, we can model everything, but no. Uh, in this case, uh, we approached these driving schools, and it was a longer time ago, but there was a survey, and uh, there was a number of driving situations described, and um, driving school students, they can rate these. Yeah? So they can eventually say, uh, this is more difficult, this is less difficult, and so on. So we do get some... Uh, idea of what is an easy to drive route or what is complicated for these driving school students. And I will show the top three. So the most complicated one is unclear complicated crossings uh, and left turns is, uh, on busy roads without traffic lights. And I have an example here. This is a crossing in Munich, uh, Lehnbachplatz, and you can see it's terrible. I have been driving there and uh, if, if someone would t tell me turn left, uh, it's, it's, uh, you can see the open street map, map here. Uh, there are two tram lines, there are several roads, there is pedestrians, there is bikes on the roads, and they are all coming from all sides at the same time, and they're also very aggressive. So it's Munich. So uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's a terrible crossing. So it, this is uh, regarded as one of the, the, the most difficult, uh, challenging situation for these driving school students, these complicated crossings. So two was the left turns. Um, left turns generally are more difficult than, than right turns. Uh, on number three, it's interesting, we have uh, bicycle drivers on the same street. And um, this is a highly dynamic phenomenon. So it's, and, and apparently, I've, I've taken a picture just uh, some weeks ago in Tallinn, where we have this, you can see it down left here, uh, where it says, okay, there's road for all us, of us on the same street. Um, this makes things complicated. Yeah? I think that at least for the driving school students, they don't want to have bikes on the streets, they don't want to have scooters on the streets or pedestrians. Maybe even for the bikes, it's nicer to have their own street. So it's to have this very, really separate pedestrians, bikes, roads, or cars. And to throw them all into the same street might be... Uh, uh, uncomfortable for all of them. Um, from a, let's say, from a geoinformatics point of view, this is highly dynamic with these bikes. It's really difficult to model. It's also really difficult to estimate if there would be bikes on the streets. Uh, in the middle picture, even, there is a very, very nice uh, bicycle road next to the road, but uh, it's not cleaned in the winter. So, of course, the bikes, again, they turn to the, to the roads together with the cars. Now there is a number of other um, situations, then uh, I will not go through this, uh, but you can see there is a ranking now. Yeah? So we have a number of situations for driving school kids and then, then eventually we can rank them and say something is more complicated and something is less complicated. Now how does this relate to routing? Um, here's one example. So this is uh, Munich as well. And you notice there we would like to go from point A to point B. And if we start here at point A, this is a route that would be given by Google Maps or Waze or other services that we have, Bolt as well. Any of these uh, routing services, it might differ a little bit depending on the traffic and uh, maybe on some hierarchies, but generally it, it gives the same route. And it starts with a very complicated left turn. Then we have another complicated left turn here. And we have another complicated left turn, and eventually we arrive in our destination. Now, for the same points, you can also, I know the area a bit, or let's say a person knows the area a bit, you would take a different route. You would take this route from A to B. This is not computed, but it's manually now put into the, into the map here. Uh, but it is very simple. Yeah? You start then you make one turn, you basically go all the way straight, and there's only one left turn and it's not too complicated. Yeah. But this route is longer and it is slower. So it is, it is easy to drive, but it is longer and slower. Therefore, our current algorithms, they are not able to compute you this route that you might would like to have here. Now, 
how can we do it? Or how can we approach it? There are two ways. One is that we could use data. So we have existing data and it's, uh, it's a lot. Yeah, we have traffic lights, we have road, uh, let's say, uh, pavements and so on and so on. So there would be an idea to use these data and build systems that acknowledge the preferences from inexperienced drivers. Yeah, for example, only routes where we have traffic lights in the turns or so on. And that would be something uh, we could already utilize. We can also go for a more algorithm approach. So um, one thing here, for example, if we have a route from A to B in a network, technically it's not too complicated to compute a route where you have only right turns. Yeah, so you would use your, use your destination, but you, it, it would be quite complicated, maybe long, but it's only right turns and you would also reach your destination. You can also put some weights and have certain right turns, some left turns and so on. If we took a, take a look at the data parts, so OpenStreetMap, for example, this is OpenStreetMap data. It has a number of nodes. So it looks like a network of, uh, of roads, but it is only the nodes from the, from the network, so are points. And there are tram lines, there are bike roads, there are sort of streets, uh, all levels. And eventually it's just the, the nodes that are within this data set. So we can easily extract these, and if we take these roads and uh, take the node extracts from them, then we can calculate densities based on these points. In this case, kernel density. Then we need to set a certain threshold. It needs to be adjusted a bit, so it needs to be playing around. And at some point, we come to obstacle polygons based on the node densities. You can see these four steps here. It's reasonably straightforward. Now, if we take these densities and uh, we have the polygons from these, we can use these as obstacle polygons. And this is a part of Munich, for example, here, where we have these obstacle polygons. And if we take a closer look to each of these obstacle polygons, then we can see it coincides quite nicely with complicated crossings. Yeah? Here are uh, three examples. So these obstacle polygons, and you can see the, the picture and the number of nodes in each of these. And yeah, eventually it looks like yeah, these are really complicated crossings here we want to see. Now we can use these obstacle polygons and integrate them. If we have a standard routing system here, um, we have, uh, this is a different route now, Theresien Wiese to the university. Um, this would be a route computed by the or again by Google or, or Waze or, or any other system, um, or tailored. And we can also say, okay, we would like to avoid our obstacle polygons and we get a different route. Yeah? It's again slightly longer and it is slower, but it avoids complicated crossings. So there's some comparison here for this driving these routes and, and checking. Now, we have avoided our three complicated crossings using this, uh, this, new, this methodology here. Now, is this useful? Um, it still it needs a bit more uh, research in this. Yeah. Is, is it really easier if we have this? It's only now focusing on complicated crossings. And is it really easier to use these kind of routes than some other computed routes? Um, I, I leave this question open. Uh, it still it could be. Eventually, the concept, if, we, if you remember, if you're driving yourself on bike or on a route or on a car or on, on, on any vehicle, in your head, you do have a routes that you like more and routes that you like less. I've, I've been driving now myself uh, bikes in Tallinn a lot, and uh, already now I start to notice some routes that I like, I like to take more and others I try to avoid. Now, um, about this methodology I just explained, it's, it's easily reproducible. Yeah, it works uh, really just on, on OpenStreetMap data. It's easy to compute. It's even computable for the, for the whole world. We have tried with, uh, with also with uh, Manhattan and with uh, Munich and with Augsburg, and it sort of gives you complicated crossings. Yeah, it's not always perfect. There are some smaller points down here. Uh, because there are so many ideas in this routing. There's really a lot of research needs to be done. Um, user tests would be something, but then also something like a fuzzy continuum. 
the concept of easy to drive route is something fuzzy. And there are many fuzzy ideas in our world, in our geogra geography world. And um, having a continuum from easy to drive to difficult to drive, that is maybe something we need to look into. And when we have a fuzzy concept, maybe we can utilize fuzzy logic to model this as well. Now there's some more ideas here, what makes routing easier. Now I'm going back to this easy uh, Führerscheinprüfung, or let's say the driver's tests. Um, for the algorithm part, I've skipped this one. There are already some ideas how to implement algorithms. They have been a long, it's not new. They have been around for a long time. Matt Duckham and others, for example, they have computed the simplest path. So you can also give a certain weight to, to left or right turns. Uh, there can be more personalized parameters, which is complicated. And I mentioned the dynamic stuff. So weather, or bikes on the road, or scooters on the road, or pedestrians. So all these dynamic objects, these are complicated in, in these kind of modeling processes. Um, application areas is fed here, because we are in our or academic bubble, let's say, and eventually, it is not utilized yet. To my understanding, these uh, driving schools, they are working very, very traditional, like they always have been. They are driving students, there is a teacher, and at some point there's a test where the, driver, uh, the tester says, okay, go that way, go that way, and then you pass or you don't pass. Um, there's also a side note, the last one here, there was a comment some longer time ago, that uh, we, uh, we don't want to compute easy to drive routes, but we want to compute complicated to drive routes. Then the drivers, uh, the students will be really well trained if they have to go through all complicated crossings in Munich. So that's, uh, that's also a good comment here. Um, I'm jumping a bit forward now. So for the personalized routing and now artificial intelligence, it's a Complicated and it's a bit out of my comfort zone, but there is so much interest in this artificial intelligence and geodata generation and geodata analysis that uh, I use, uh, I'm trying to give a few ideas as well here. Um, there was just a panel discussion, this term geo-AI, I think it needs a more clear definition. What is it and how do we deal with it? Um, the panel discussion, it was a conference in Helsinki, just in Aalto University, just a few weeks ago. And one comment from these panelists uh, also was, I can ask Siri to give me the greenest route to a shop, and it will do so. Now, this is correct. I, I believe there's systems, and maybe Siri can already do this. And if not, then technically it's, it's probably uh, possible to implement these functionalities. But where is the artificial intelligence in this? I, I, would not, I would not see it right away. Maybe I'm, I'm missing that, but classically this would not be, in my uh, terms, artificial intelligence here. Now, I've looked around in this artificial intelligence a bit. I, guess I believe most of us have uh, done that. There's this Microsoft Copilot, for example, and uh, when it gives you uh, a routing from Tallinn University to Tartu Market Square, uh, this is the result. Uh, this is not really a routing map or anything, it's just a picture. Um, I think there is a link missing sort of this way. Yeah? So um, it, it will be solved at some point. I'm, I'm very sure Microsoft is on it and as soon as you will, you will ask for a map with a route, then it will link to a different service and not to the picture generator here. Now, something is important in that context. Um, there is a very good publication, The Ethics of AI-Generated Maps, and it studies these DALI generations and uh, implications for cartography in this case. And uh, this has been also presented in, in these key days there at some point in Alto. And I noticed one, one thing here. Uh, it is irreproducibility. It's a very difficult word try to say it three times <laughs> after another. So I've, I've practiced it, irreproducibility. Um, but this irreproducibility hits into the heart of our scientific understanding. 
classically, we would make studies, we would make cases, uh, and it, they should be reproducible. And we should be able to get the data at some point and to use the methodologies and at some point redo studies. But if this artificial intelligence and uh, also in, in mapping here uh, is producing something, uh, it's not reproducible. It's a black box, it gives you something, it gives you good stuff as well, but uh, it's impossible to redesign, re-engineer. There's also, in this case, you can see the different, if you use the same prompts to generate maps, it will give you different results each time. And it's a dynamic system, so it learns, and it will give you each prompt, it will give you a different result at some point. Now, there's one final thing here also, which is, is noticeable. It's the monetization of AI services. Um, it's already ongoing. This ChatGPT and others, they were really pioneers, and, um, and also uh, the Copilot is still free and so. But um, if, you, if you now make some tests, for example, a bus info request here, just a bus from uh, Tallinn to Tartu, um, it's full of commercials already. Yeah? Just click here and use it and so on. And even the suggestions that are there are not particularly good. So in this case, uh, this monetization of AI services mi uh, might kill at some point the excitement for it. I, I, at least I'm less excited now when I'm pounded with these commercials here. About the future towards AI. Now, one thing, a few statements, so personalized view a bit. Um, it is a very dynamic field of research, and I think we cannot get rid of it anymore. It will change the way we are doing stuff. Uh, it will change the way we are generating data, maybe also how we are analyzing data. And uh, we, we need to follow up on this. Uh, from a tra more traditional point of view, understanding or my understanding, was that uh, artificial intelligence is very good in signal processing and pattern recognition. So it worked very well in image analysis. It worked also very well, it still does. It does work very well in uh, remote sensing uh, generated images. So getting a, a semantic into a remote sensed image, that this kind of stuff that is really very advanced. Now there might be many other fields and it's uh, something that that will change also the mobile Tartu approach in the, in the near future. The last point, I'm linking it a bit back to these driver's beginner's ideas. Um, can we think of an, uh, some AI trained system? Maybe, I don't think that driving schools are recording trajectories of their driving students at the moment, but at some point they might, or maybe they have done it already, I was not aware, um, and that could be used for maybe training a system that will provide a more easy to drive route. What about trust? So, to, to finish up with this, um, artificial intelligence and mobility research, is there some trust and cartography? And basically we can continue this list. There's many other ideas. Well, we are able to generate information already with uh, artificial intelligence. So if we use ChatGPT or others, we can also generate geodata. And we can even generate very good geodata. We have run some tests uh, generating tourist sites in Helsinki and geocoding them as well. It takes just a few minutes. It will give you a very good tourist site list, including the locations. But can we trust these maps? Can we trust these generated maps or information? Well, there's still question marks here, and I have the last fat point here. So having trustworthy information, I think, it, it, will it be part of our research domain? And I finish with this here, so thanks. Jukka, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for this uh, Reinhardt lecture. Uh, for these insights, um, and, and you really uh, opened up one of the new topics of, of Mobile Tartu conference, the AI and geo-AI, and how, how that is going to affect um, uh, 
uh, mobility research, and, and indeed we are going to hear more tomorrow and also in the panel discussion, but now uh, we take questions. And I forgot to mention earlier, but within this recording uh, um, environment, the workshop environment, it's also possible for you to pose questions uh, on the link that if you go to mobiletartu ut.ee, you will find the link to workshop environment of this Mobile Tartu 2024. Uh, and there on each uh, session, um, also the paper sessions later, today and tomorrow and on Friday, you can also pose questions uh, via this um, tab. So, so, but now, any questions from the audience, please? Hi, uh, Robin Lovelace, University of Leeds. Um, just uh, on the mobility theme and its links to AI, one of the one of the common threads that seems to be prominent in this um, mobile Tartu conference, and this is my first time, is sustainability. And I just wondered if you thought about the possible contradiction between um, researching sustainable mobility, but then using um, AI systems that may be very energy intensive to build the computers, build the clusters and also to run them. And that's something that I'm conscious of as someone who loves using big computers. So yeah, just a, a question about sustainability. Uh, thanks, Robin. Um, it's a complicated question because I can only speculate. I've not thought that much about this, yeah, stable system and routing. Um, and I think it's still fluid. I'm not even sure if it's possible to answer such a question at this point because the, the, it's, it's not yet clear how this artificial intelligence technology will affect routing services if at some point. We are still in the way where we have sophisticated routing models. We, have, no, we had a wonderful presentation yesterday from Bolt <laughs> that was uh, explaining a bit more. Um, but there was also no artificial intelligence yet in that. Thanks. <laughs> Matthew Zook, University of Kentucky. Um, I really want to follow up on this, this issue of trust that you brought up. I thought that was a really interesting you know, kind of way of thinking about it. And also the tests that you were running on, like, okay, what are top you know, tourist destinations and geocoding them? Um, because I think I mean, that, that's a really interesting question to start out with, but then start thinking about you know, if, you know, other kinds of questions might ask. It's like, well, how do I go from point A to point B, but I want to avoid this neighborhood because I don't like the people who live there? Or uh, show me the good neighborhoods to live in and things like that. So I was wondering if you'd have done any uh, thinking or uh, experimenting with that. Thanks, Matt. Um, no, no social uh, information included in these routing models at the moment. I think there, there are studies on that. Actually, by, by the way, and there's, uh, I'm not sure about this neighborhood that I would avoid. I, I'm not aware of anything like this. I think it's more into the positive side. So I want to have a very green route or I want to have a very quiet route or shady route. Um, these kind of, uh, of studies I remember. And they are somewhat also related to pedestrians and to bikes. So I hope that helps. <laughs> You, you presented us with an example on, uh, on car navigation, but I think that the same very much goes into for uh, walking and, and cycling, uh, and perhaps even mm -hmm. uh, finding the paths, proper paths to, to get into a public transit stop. Have you also tried out with this kind of uh, sustainable mobility modes first and then multimodal mobility second? Mm -hmm. The multimodal mobility is, is one thing, so, it has so many facades because there's the signal processing part yeah, to see what kind of mode we might have. And there's quite sophisticated methodologies based on trajectories where you can recognize what kind of transportation is used. Um, and you're right, absolutely right. So if you use pedestrians or if you use bikes, you can also have certain personal parameters. And if I recall right in Helsinki, there's an extensive project on that where you are investigating exactly this, yeah, biking routes for personalized parameters. 
Yes, uh, indeed, uh, there is. And I think we are going to hear more about yeah. that also during those days. Uh, but once, uh, like a few years ago, uh, we heard that Google comes out with this kind of um, green path routing itself. And that meant that, hey, we want to show the car drivers the greenest route. Uh, how to get from point A to point B. So in principle, the calmest route, the most easy to drive route. And that might actually introduce more cars into neighborhoods that, that want to be quiet, that, that are local neighborhoods, that might have more greenery, which are more pleasant for pedestrians. And now you introduce more um, pollution into there. So how do you deal with these kind of contradictions that might pop up when we only talk mm. about data? Question, yeah. Um, of course, there is more to uh, planning and to, to routing than the, the algorithm that we yeah. use. So if we have uh, an underlying data model that recognizes the neighborhoods that perhaps we want to keep quiet or uh, other route parts that we don't want to have uh, traffic in, uh, then of course this can be implemented in the routing functionalities. There is very clear threat, I wouldn't call it, but uh, let's say le legislation in Munich coming up that uh, diesel cars will be not allowed within the inner ring of the city anymore. And um, this, of course, will affect routing as well. So it's not only the car, but it depends also what kind of car do you have. You have an electric car or you have a diesel car. Um, that will also affect your routing results at some point. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Alexander. Because first there, yeah. Uh, thank you for lecture, Alexander Karasov, University of Helsinki. And I'm wondering, uh, uh, when you talked about the pro pro problematic crossroads, etc., uh, I'm wondering, do you know any work which would implement participatory component in it? In, in case, for example, we ask uh, some reasonable number of people about their preferences in driving, depending on their, for example, level of uh, expertise or experience in driving, etc. And then we might train some model which would uh, uh, then take into account uh, several factors which have affecting that choice of drivers and then uh, we would get rid of this, you know, uh, vicious circle of uh, uh, greenery or shadiness or something like that, but we might, uh, might uh, come up with um, uh, uh, like an ecological niche probably, so a combination of factors which would, mm -hmm. uh, in combination, uh, as a result of probably interactions among them, sustain bad driving experience. Then what about this? direction of future? Yeah. Um, I would refer to the location-based service community in that sense, because I, I cannot recall now right away uh, studies that have done this approach, but it sounds a bit familiar. So having uh, personalized preferences in not only driving, but let's say generally also in biking and in pedestrians, um, there are studies like this. I recall it from the previous location-based service conferences, especially in the track on navigation and wayfinding, there are these kind of studies, um, in particular for pedestrians, which is interesting. So how do you feel when you walk a certain route? Um, is, it, is it a comfortable route to walk? Uh, these kind of studies, they are done and they are also redone. So it's it's basically every few years when we have uh, studies coming up that tackle this problem. Uh, hi, Professor Yuka and uh, Nianhua from Taiwan Munich. First slide, thank you for shouting out from Munich. We do need the excellent city architect like in Tartu, like to hide <laughs> in Munich. And my question is actually about uh, uh, those like the mapping. You also talk about the GeoAI maps and then, but I think like maybe the question will go more to this kind of the user interface. Like before that we have last 20 years, you know, like from the cars and also like the mobile phone, like those like the maps they are, we all counted on the, those kind of the graphic user interface, like 
people need those skills that to interact with those like the mapping system, the like mobile map or the maps in the car, like in EV, like out of it, and those kind. And it, it did need some skills like to teach others, like for example, like elders, like I can, I can never teach my grandma how to use the mapping navigation, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But then lots of people now, they, they said like starting from the language user interface, like the, from the large language model, and then they might have the language user interface, and then it might also changing the future of this kind of the mapping interaction or the inter user interface of the maps. And then do you think that it's possible? If so, how to like, how should we also like maybe give some standard of it and then like to this to lead the way, guide the way also to switching that from graph user interface to those kind of um, mm -hmm. language user interface for the, for the mobile map for us. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, thanks. Um, I think there's is different, uh, two different approaches. Mm -hmm. So one is if we want to use these geo AI ideas in really in modeling, routing, and in, in computing routes. And the other one is that if we use these large language models and just use it as an interface to interact with more traditional ways of uh, routing. And uh, I've, I've experienced or seen this also in, in geographic information systems, for example. Yeah? So large language models, you could speak with them, you could speak with your GIS, and eventually in the background it will still run the same functionalities that are there. But the interface, of course, that uh, is a good idea, it might change, and that might also apply to routing services. Yeah? So speaking with your routing service it will understand your request and it will compute in the background what you would like to have. But then the artificial intelligence part is only in the, in the interface, in the recognition. Yeah. Martin. Uh, Martin Haumer, University of Tartu. Uh, looking into the future, if we can see that AI is becoming, uh, having an even more important role in increasing uh, the usability of these routing algorithms, and uh, I imagine then we will also increase our reliance on routing algorithms, do you think this could also have unwanted consequences? Uh, absolutely, yes. And, <laughs> and uh, as a previous speaker said, we are the ones creating this. So do we want to create this that way? Yeah, we could also say that artificial intelligence is interesting, and, uh, but maybe this is not the way to go in these in this routing services, and we stay with the more traditional approach and, and take our data and model more sophisticated algorithms, and then yeah, there's really no, no need for having a training a sort of a black box. That will, uh, that, that will eventually give us roots or will give us answers to a certain question. Um, this, I think I mentioned it quite clearly. One uh, danger that I see is indeed the complicated word of irreproducibility. Because really that, that hits into it. If we, if we have a study or a, a function or a software and we are not able to how complicated it may be if we're not able to re-engineer what has been going on and why we have now a certain route or a certain decision. Uh, that will, in my opinion, cause, uh, let's say, difficult impacts. Yeah. Yeah. We have one question over here. So, would you trust <laughs> and drive an AI-generated route? <laughs> yeah. If not now, <laughs> then would you trust it when it needs to happen? What needs to happen that you would trust it? Yeah, um, probably I would trust it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, uh, it is a, it's a difficult question because I have not used it yet, or <laughs> to my understanding, that they're not there yet. Um, but we do trust also machines in different contexts. Yeah, so if uh, apparently not sure, but if you have an, if you fly an airplane, it eventually it can land without a pilot. Maybe it can even land better than a human pilot. Mm. So uh, perhaps an, an artificially generated route would be better than something I would try to put myself together. Yeah, and probably you yeah, have to be bold enough to get out from your comfort zone and then, you know, <laughs> give trust to these uh, systems and the developers of those uh, 
those models behind that, behind that AI. So do you have any further questions from the audience? Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, Laurel Sparks, University of Kentucky. I was just curious if you've given any thought or know of any work that's given the thought of how city urban planners might adapt to these alternative routing things if they are implemented. Because it does fundamentally change the way that we understand travel. It removes us from time and distance. Um, and that, of course, changes how we plan and predict for future cities. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that. Yes, thank you, Laura. Um, I have some. I, I don't have an interdisciplinary team in that sense. So the easy que the easy answer would be not not really. Uh, I, I haven't thought or we haven't thought about these implications for planning. But nevertheless, uh, as I mentioned in between, we are a bit in our academic bubble, and I take this question also as an encouragement that we are we should. We should uh, approach maybe the Tartu or university city planning or the, uh, any planners to approach them and tell a little bit more what we are doing and what, what is there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I think that the, with this, um, oops, we come to a closing of oh. this Reina House. Keynote lecture, we thank you, Yuka, very much. And uh, this is for you, the National Atlas of Estonia. Mm -hmm. And we know that you very much long for that. <laughs> Not only for that, it's a very beautiful book. Uh, yeah. Excellent, uh, excellent Atlas uh, of Estonia, excellent examples of historic uh, maps, uh, as well as contemporary maps of Estonia. But you would also like to use it, it in your teaching, yeah. and that is something that I find very, very <laughs> lovely. So, thank you, thank you Yukka. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.